Welcome to Doc Talk, a weekly podcast featuring Monument Health physicians addressing medical topics. Tune into your health with Monument Health. Hello again, and welcome to Doc Talk with Monument Health. My name is Mark Houston, and joining me again today is Dr. Siri Knutson Larson of uh, with Dermatology at Monument Health. Uh, the last time uh, Dr. Siri and I talked, we just kind of got the, the the basics and the lowdown about your skin and how to take care of it and what you need to do when you were in the 80s in a tanning bed, and now you realize that was just a really poor decision and how you need to get that fixed. And uh, Dr. Knutz and Larson and her entire team can help you with that. Um, so we just kind of laid the groundwork last time we talked, doctor, and this time I'd like to get a little more specific on... Uh, I think the biggest worry that people have when they realize now they've been out in the sun a lot and they maybe probably didn't take the right precautions that the most common type of, I I believe, uh, cancer is skin cancer. And I think that can be scary to a lot of people, obviously, Mm -hmm. cancer, that word alone. Um, So let's kind of talk a little bit about the, the, the main or specific types of skin cancer that you mostly see. What's probably the most common? Well, I'd like to say that one in five Americans will develop a skin cancer at some point. So I think that's significant. I would say the most common type of skin skin cancer that we see in our clinic would be squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma. They have very different names and the names differ mainly because they're made up of different cell types. Okay. However, they are both induced by sunlight. There are some genetic syndromes and some medications that make you more likely to develop these types of skin cancers. But for the most part, in the majority of Americans, your standard skin cancer will be caused by the sun that you had when you were young. So basically the way that these are going to present either of them, a lot of times patients are going to say to me, well, it started as a pimple. It started as something that didn't heal. And then it progressed and progressed until they finally come to see me. Okay. Um, And then we treat them specific to what we need to do based on the biopsy that we perform in the office at that time. So that's basically how how it starts is is something that wasn't there before and generally doesn't heal. Is that kind of the most common? Yep, I would say that that's the most common. So I'm assuming people try to treat them in a myriad of different ways and they're like, man, nothing's working. So I got to go. I've had patients put on different antibiotic creams all the way to ranchers actually cutting them off with their own pocket knives. So it's very variable (laughs) what you see in our clinic. (laughs) I would would assume that that is really not recommended. Yes, that's not. (laughs) That's not. And I also should say, because this is a public health forum, there Mm -hmm. are some patients we have seen that have used a product called Black salve, which is um, a product, I don't actually know where they where they get this, but essentially it, it you put it on the skin cancer and it just kills the skin and it's very dangerous product. So please avoid it. Oh, really? Is that that's something that, that, that you can just get like... I don't actually know where people oh, buy it. I've really? never oh, asked. Oh, boy. It's one <laughs> of those back alley sort of things. Back alley type things. Like, don't use it. Let's <laughs> not do that. Uh, so when they come to you and, and, it, and it gets diagnosed, what's, what's usually the 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 first step then for you once you see it? So the first step is going to be a biopsy in Mm -hmm. our office so we can classify what type of skin cancer it is. And and basically what a biopsy entails is a numbing injection. So we numb the skin and then we use a very small razor blade to remove a small piece of skin. And then we send that to the pathologist. And the pathologist is is a certified physician who looks at something underneath the microscope and then is able to tell us what the cancer is, if it is a cancer, and then we're able to take that knowledge based on what what the cancer was and make a treatment plan. Treatment plans are very variable based on a specific patient. I would say for the most part, if you develop a skin cancer on your head or your neck region, you likely will undergo the Mohs micrographic surgery procedure. Other areas of the bodies can be treated with things like a simple skin excision, which means you take a small or a football shape, not size, of skin around. <laughs> I made that clarify mistake that. of not clarifying <laughs> that once. <laughs> around around the skin cancer, and then you put it back together with stitches. There are some topical therapies or um, chemotherapy creams that we can use for certain types of skin cancers. And finally, there's a procedure called electrodesiccation and curatage, where we actually numb the skin and then we scrape and burn it on three different cycles. And that's very appropriate for certain types of skin cancer on the body as well. So it's not a cut and dry answer for every single skin cancer because it really depends on the patient. 
the location, and patients' other health issues and how we make our decisions. So probably the most common procedure, would you say, it is that Mohs micrograph? For the head and the neck, yes, okay. absolutely. And how does, how does that work then uh, when you sit down with a patient, a patient rather, and you say, all right, here, here's the process, here's what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. How does that work? So basically, uh, we do the biopsy, and then my nurses will call and give them the results. And, and most of the time, I've told the patient in advance, this is likely a skin cancer. We will treat this with a Mohs surgery. And a lot of my patients have had a Mohs surgery before because mm-hmm. once you've had one skin cancer, your risk of getting another is quite high. Um, but then we bring the patient back to the office on a regular day, and they don't have to go to sleep. They come in. We tell them to have a breakfast before they come. We expect them to be there for four to six hours, sometimes all day, depending on the cancer. Mm-hmm. We take what we can see with the naked eye. And then we send that to our lab, which is right across the hallway, who processes that skin for us. And then I'm, or the other most surgeons, are able to look at the specimen under the microscope. And then we go back to right where we need to go if there is more skin cancer remaining. And we repeat that process till we get all of the skin cancer and give you a 99% cure rate for most skin cancers. Boy, that's amazing. Have, have you seen... Have you seen the the speed and the change of this throughout your career from what it used to be to now or is that Moe's always kind of been yeah how, how long has Moe's been around Since when I think it's the 1920s but I'd have to look that up wow. 1920s or 30s so Fred Moe's is the uh, physician who pioneered the technique at the University of Wisconsin he was actually a general surgery resident and was training to be a surgeon and had this idea about this technique and basically quit his residency and trained multiple people to perform the technique. So it's it's one of those, uh, you know, kind of rare medical procedures that has been right from the start. And it, has, it has evolved quite a bit sure. in, in its technique. And I would say over the years become more speedy based on different technology that we have. I would say that reconstruction has also become a bigger part of the most surgery side in the past. The that basically just removing the skin cancer was the main thing the Mohs surgeon did, but now it's both. So we're able to remove the skin cancer, and then we have special training into how to give you an aesthetic result for the closure. Sure. So, uh, And I'm sure that's important to a lot of people. If you're yes. getting it on the face or the head or anything Absolutely. like that, you don't want a, yeah, a yeah. giant divot. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. It's very be. important. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, you, you mentioned uh, the, the two most common you see. Are, are there others that are a little more rare that come in um, that are either a little bit more serious or a little bit more uh, harder to treat, maybe? Yes. Let me give one other point, though, about the the basal cell and squamous cell. I would say the most common thing that we actually see in our clinic, even before that, is something called an actinic keratosis. And an actinic keratosis is a pre precursor, excuse me, to a squamous cell. And we treat hundreds of those in our clinic every day. And essentially what those are going to present as are rough red scaly spots, usually in areas of chronic sun damage. So they're very common on the face. Ears in men are a very common location for them arms and hands, areas that have had that chronic sun exposure. And so patients that do have a lot of those, we, we definitely do see them on a regular basis because we know that their risk is going to be higher. Okay. Treatments include, of those, just simple freezing in the office. We also often will use what we call field therapy for patients who have multiple, which is pretty common actually. And that can be with a cream. We have several different types of cream that we do that with. And then last but not least, we do do a device called the blue light where we actually bring a patient in and put them under a special light to destroy the precancers as well. So the the freezing, is that similar to uh, like a wart removal exactly. almost? Exactly. It's the same exact uh, technique. Really? Mm-hmm. God, that's fascinating. Yes. I, just the, I don't the think way... my patients would say that when I'm freezing. <laughs> <laughs> does, it, is it, does it hurt? It stings. Is, does yeah, it really? yeah, it burns. It's so cold. I, I want to say it's negative 200 degrees below zero. Oh I can't goodness. remember the exact statistics or 198. Anyways, <laughs> um, so it burns. It, it feels like dry ice going on your skin. Well, like with the compound W that people use for wart removal. Is that, I mean... I think it's uh, probably more more intense than that. Okay. Yes. Uh, so the the other um, the, the other types of, of skin cancer that you see or what, 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 other, what other things should people be looking out for you you've talked about because i think in the last time we talked you talked about the a b c d e mm-hmm. is what you're looking for can you, can you go over that one more yeah, time for absolutely people? so the american academy of dermatology put forth these categories that i think are really awesome for patients to be able to think in their mind so a b c d e a is going to be asymmetry meaning if you lifted a mole off your skin you couldn't fold it in half equally so it's going to have asymmetry on either side now i wanted to I wanted to kind of uh, get a little more specific on that. If if you have something on your skin, is it generally going to be the more round something mm-hmm. is, 
is that less likely generally? It I can't say that for sure because okay. obviously there are, but I sure. would say a majority of, of the very scary skin cancers, such as melanoma, are going to have not a neat, round appearance. They're going to be a little more gnarly, a little mm-hmm. more, okay. That's yeah. that. That's what I wanted to clear up with that because I've heard before that – you know, oh, it's it's you know, if it's the, the the more symmetrical it is, the least likely you are to worry. But I would say the less likely you are to worry. There are rare instances. Though. Okay, all right. So, um, B is border. So if the borders are regular, C is color. So I like to say red, white, blue. So colors of the flag plus black. Um, D is diameter. So bigger than a pencil eraser. And E, I think, is the most important. So even going back to your point about just a round mole Mm -hmm. not being dangerous. Well, E is evolving. So if you have a mole that's round and it starts to change, that means it's evolving. And so it doesn't matter what anything else is doing. You should get that checked. Okay. And I think a stat that I said last time that I think is really helpful is that 80% of moles that – or sorry, 80% of melanomas – are going to develop in a new mole. So all of a sudden you notice on your arm in the shower, I never had that before. Oh, whoa, it's growing. That needs to be seen. Okay. And then also 20% of melanomas, the other 20%, are going to develop within moles you already have. So again, that evolving piece. So if you have a mole that all of a sudden starts to change, even if you've already had it your whole life, get it checked. So you recommend probably when people get into their 40s and 50s to make regular appointments. I think regular, you know, I think it's always a good idea to have a baseline and then let your board certified dermatologist tell you, I feel like we need to see you on a regular sure. basis. And there's some patients that we don't feel like we need to. Maybe they protected their skin better as a child. Hard to say. But, <laughs> you know, there are some that we don't just don't feel like you need to see on a regular basis. Right. And we, we, we talked last time too. Uh, you know, one of the most important things to do when living in this area is to uh, get sunscreen, uh, protect yourself with sunscreen, obviously, because that's that's your your skin and, and the DNA in your skin. Uh, I've read, and, and this is kind of another one of those little weird, interesting tidbits that I came across, um, that once you get a sunburn, and tell me if this is right or wrong, or this is just internet's lore, your, your, your body, uh, the skin will actually... How was that worded now? I can't remember. But the DNA in your skin will will kill itself, will will do will mm-hmm. is that how it protects you? It causes the... da- DNA damage. Yeah. Um I don't think that's how it protects you necessarily. Oh, the I, internet's stupid. Yeah, I don't know how they dumb. would have worded that. I wouldn't believe it. But like I like I said, five or more sunburns between the age of fifteen and twenty are gonna increase your risk of melanoma by eighty percent, which I should just specifically talk about melanoma. Yes, Um, let's. And melanoma is a different, so when I initially started talking, we talked about squamous cell and basal cell. Mm -hmm. Those are the most common types of skin cancer we see. They're made out of skin cells, okay? Melanoma is not as common, and it's made out of cells that make up moles, so darker pigmented cells for the most part. Okay. Okay. Melanomas can be dangerous if left undetected because melanomas, unlike most squamous cells and basal cells, melanomas can actually grow deeper into the skin and they can start invading other areas like your lymph nodes. And if you really have end stage disease, can invade your brain, your lungs, your liver, and ultimately cause death. So it's as serious a cancer as it, you can have. It's very serious. Thankfully, our treatments have greatly improved over the last 10 years, but nothing is perfect. Right. And so melanoma, if you catch melanoma within the first year, 99% of patients most likely will survive and it will, it will be a very good outcome. So you have, I mean, 365 days. I mean, there's, mm-hmm. there's, it's, it's, it's not fast. It depends on the type of melanoma. Okay. So, so okay. if you really want to break it down, you can go into different subtypes of melanoma and some, the very superficial kinds tend to be less aggressive than the nodular deeper kinds. Right. Okay. So it depends on the type of disease. Um, but it really, what it boils down to is if you have a changing mole, get it checked. Because if you do have one of those types of melanoma that grows quickly, you only have so much time. And one American, about one American every hour dies of melanoma. And it's a one, nobody should die of melanoma. Right. Not with our sunscreen, not with our early detection. Nobody should die of melanoma and everybody should have a high awareness for changing moles on their skin. So, well, that's, that's really, that is great advice. It's to hear you say that, yeah, this is almost a 100% preventable mm-hmm. condition, mm-hmm. Uh, I think is, is, it can be reassuring 
Um, but it, it could also mean for people that probably didn't spend a lot of time taking care of themselves <laughs> to get checked. Exactly. To make sure that they're that, that they're going to be protected. And I will say that men have a higher risk of melanoma in the long run. And the place that men develop melanomas most frequently is going to be on the back. And so they can't see that area. Right? Oh, of course. And sure. so I encourage men's spouses to keep an eye on mm-hmm. their, their spouse's back. Um, same with females. Females are going to develop them more frequently on the legs. Um, so if, if a spouse notices a spot on the leg that the female can't, see it's really checking each other too and right being sure <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> going on. Uh, i get a lot of men that come in because their wives say they have to so <laughs> <laughs> well you know look we're not the smartest of the two okay <laughs> we're stubborn and we don't want to admit that that's you know yeah. we, it's a tough thing yes. i i get it but don't yeah it's it's uh, again something so easily preventable is when you go outside grabbing some some good broad spectrum sunscreen and just making sure you got it on you. It, exactly. it takes 30 seconds to do when you're mowing the yard, when you're up at the lake, you know, and you mentioned last time we talked too, which I thought was interesting. And I don't think a lot of people think about is the altitude that we have here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, what was the, you, the stat you gave for that? So every thousand feet you raise yeah. into the air, you increase your UV exposure by eight to 10%. So being That's in Rapid lot. City versus yeah. being in Lee Deadwood, you're going to have, you know, two times higher sun rates there, right. right? Or 20% potentially higher sun rate there. So very, very important. I would say the other thing that I often recommend is a wide brim hat. And so a lot of people say, I wear a hat every day, but a lot of times people- Doesn't cover your ears. Doesn't cover your ears. <laughs> and I, I can't tell you how many skin cancers I take off men's ears most frequently because they don't have hair that covers them. But it also covers the back of your neck. Okay, oh, sure. And it's going to give you about 80% coverage of your face and your ears and your back of your neck. So a wide brim hat. And then I really do feel I have a redheaded three-year-old. And no matter how often I put his sunscreen on, he still gets pink. And so though there is something to be said about UV protective clothing as well. And it's gr- you, there oh, are so sure. many great products out there now. And they're cheap. They're affordable. I wear one when I'm outside working in my yard. I always kind of have a sun shirt on. Yeah. You can get rash guards for when you're at the lake to protect your back in your chest. Lots of different lightweight. A lot of people say, I don't want to wear those. They're too hot. But really, it's improved drastically. Yeah, they're not at all. They're not. They're very lightweight and nice. So those are also something to invest in. Now, speaking of that really quick before uh, before we wrap this up, you mentioned that you have a uh, child with red hair. Yes. Now, are are red-haired people Mm -hmm. with fairer skin, are they more prone? Is that a true, is that kind of a true fact? I actually tell patients that I have red hair. So there's a couple different reasons that is. There's a mutation within the redheaded population that causes them to be a redhead. And within that mutation, they make a certain type of pigment in their skin that's not as common in someone who's not a redhead. And when you have more of that pigment, there's two things that happen. Number one, you don't tan very easily, so you get burned very, very easily. So that already increases your risk. But number two, the studies have shown in like translational research that patients with higher amount of that type of pigment also have a higher risk of melanoma. So Mm. it's a double hit issue there. So redheads, when I go to the beach and I see a redhead trying to tan, I want to go tap them on the shoulder and say, stop, (laughs) it's not going to (laughs) help. But Uh, so (laughs) So just don't do it. (laughs) uh, So which uh, which one uh, is best? Is it is 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 it us brunettes? Are we the one that are that are better? You know, uh, (laughs) (laughs) you're going to have a little more protection at least. So yes. yes. Uh, Well, Dr. Siri Knutson Larson, thank you very much for again, uh, spending time um, and, and talking about this, I think, I think in general around here, people understand that they need to protect their skin, but I don't think they really understand the importance of it. <laughs> right. Uh, and, uh, just having your thoughts and, uh, what you've told us here, I hope, I hope a lot of people will be a lot safer now for the rest of this summer. <laughs> I'm glad I could help. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and if you ever need, um, any sort of, uh, dermatology, uh, appointments, consultations, uh, help at all. The Monument is just a great place to go, and you and your department, I think, are fantastic. Thank you. Thank yes, you. thank you very much for talking with us. It's uh, Doc Talk uh, with Monument Health. I'm Mark Houston.